I wanted to start off with uh, a couple of reasons to be cheerful. I've got two at the start, and I'm going to come back to the third one later on. Reason number one to be cheerful, uh, I think um, from an urban perspective, from a city region's perspective, is that we have some changes which could, could give us something that looks, feels more like London. So when you get off a uh, station at a major city in the rest of England, it feels more like one network, one brand, one ticketing system. Someone is in charge. Uh, someone provides information. And I think the route to that is threefold. We've got the buses bill coming up. And if the government is as good as its word, all transport authorities and those represented in this room will have significant extra powers in just one year's time. Everyone will get powers to uh, develop much more effective partnership arrangements uh, through what are going to be called enhanced partnerships. And for city regions with a mayor and others at the Secretary of State's discretion, they will also get a much simpler route to bus franchising. Bus franchising will allow you to specify one network, one fare system, one system. And then we've got rail devolution. Uh, rail devolution is pushed to the side of the rail debate sometimes. It shouldn't be. It's happening everywhere. Where it is applied, it's succeeding. So it's working in Scotland on ScotRail. It's working on London Overground. Uh, it's working on Merseyrail Rail Electrics. It's being implemented on Northern Rail. West Midlands Rail is coming up. It's happening uh, across significant tranches of a network. And with rail devolution, again, it gives you the power to specify and to integrate rail services with bus services, with uh, transit systems that a local transport authority may already provide, like tram systems. And finally, to bind it all together, we have smart ticketing. And sometimes the debate uh, from uh, London is that there is no smart ticketing up north. Get your act together. But well, we do have smart ticketing. Here is my M card, which I can beep on the trains and the buses in West Yorkshire, and it does work. The problem is, under the current system, uh, the kind of fares that people can put on here if they want something that goes across all modes can be too expensive when compared with the single operator modes. But some of the measures we're talking around uh, uh, in these legislation could address that. So that's reason one to be cheerful. Reason two to be cheerful, uh, as well as a greater focus on the recognition that we need integrated transport, high quality integrated transport in our major cities. Uh, uh, the coin has also dropped on the need for better links between our cities with Transport for the North and Midlands Connect and linking into the National Infrastructure Commission. And there should be really good synergies between the kind of work we're doing on the cities and the kind of work these bodies are doing on the links between the cities. So those are my two reasons to be cheerful, but uh, I wouldn't want anyone to go away from a transport conference with the impression that everything was fine. So, um, reasons to be less cheerful, although capital, we're doing okay. Uh, revenue, not so good. Uh, so, the first picture illustrates the kind of offices, transport offices, uh, we could be looking at in local transport authorities, not perhaps quite as flash as that one, but with no one in them because we don't have the revenue to pay the transport officers to provide the bus services that go on uh, the better capital infrastructure, uh, hence the uh, dilapidated bus shelter on the right, which could be the fate of a lot of bus services and already is with the impacts of revenue cuts that are going on at the moment. But I want to spend most of my time looking to some future challenges, which I know you've been doing today, because um, I think the future is, is speeding up. Uh, we did a piece of work last year. It's on our website, where uh, the subtext for this report was kind of an idiot's guide to the future, really. We called it Horizon Scan, the implications for urban transport policy of transformative social and technological change. And what we tried to do in this report is to look at an overview of all the issues, all the big changes that are going on in society uh, and what the implications for urban transport might be and how forward-thinking transport authorities might respond. And those were the key trends it uh, found in a nutshell. Um, changes in demographics and lifestyles and the rise of a sharing economy will alter mobility choices. More powers are devolved to cities and city regions, which results in more innovation and leadership in responding to urban challenges in locally appropriate ways. Advances in technology and increased digital connectivity make transport infrastructure smarter and more efficient. And urbanisation, climate change and the need to improve air quality puts pressure on transport systems. So those are four big trends. Uh, you're welcome to download the document to, to go into more detail. Uh, but I think also there's a sense that the future is speeding up, but these trends are coming at us rather faster than we might have anticipated and rather faster than we might like. Uh, so here's just four examples. Uh, top left-hand corner, that's a Chinese 
uh, electric double-decker bus. Not so long ago, people were telling me that single double-decker electric buses uh, were not going to happen anytime soon. They're running at the bottom of my street at the moment in York, and soon we're going to have double-decker electric buses as well. Then we've got the tablet. Uh, ten years ago, no Facebook, no Twitter, no iPhones, no iPads. It's unimaginable, isn't it? But uh, it wasn't that long ago. And then we've got Uber, uh, which in just uh, six years didn't exist, and now is turning the taxi market upside down in city after cities. And then we've got connected autonomous vehicles. So all these trends are coming at us quite fast. And what I wanted to do in the remaining time um, was just to pick out a few trends uh, and say a little bit about what we might be doing about that. Um, so the first of which uh, was, I think we need to get better at capturing the widest benefits in the most efficient way. And going back to my earlier point about revenue funding being uh, at a particular premium and going down, um, what can we do about that? Uh, well, here's one example. Um, there's a lot of publicly funded uh, collective transport going around. Uh, it tends to be organized through separate bureaucracies, separate funding streams. In many cases, people are making a separate profit off the top of these separate modes. Um, in rural areas, a lot of it will be subsidised, including the rail service, of course. And that's one of the things that the Total Transport Initiative that the government is piloting is seeking to tackle. Uh, and I think uh, that's good. I think we need to see how the pilot results come out. But I think it's very much at the spear tip of what we need to do more widely, which is to be better at uh, capturing the wider benefits that transport brings. So transport gets people into employment. It gets the workers into work, for example. Uh, and there are many schemes that, including our, some of our members, some of our uh, PTE members like Centro, uh, doing workwise schemes which puts advisors into job centres to tell unemployed people how they can uh, get access to uh, uh, places of work and job interviews and provides free transport for them to get there. Seems to be very cost effective. The figures seem to be very good. Uh, the D D DWP pockets the savings in, in the unemployment benefits saved. Uh, does it put anything in to these initiatives? No, it does not. Uh, another example, too, in terms of health care, our investment in uh, active travel contributes to public health. Uh, bus services get people to health care appointments, prevent uh, missed appointments, which saves money for the Department of Health. Uh, are we fully realising these benefits? Are we breaking down these barriers between sectors as much as we might? I don't think so. So we're going to do some more work in this area in the year to come, uh, do some roundtables, hopefully with the Treasury, uh, and number 10, uh, around how we can uh, move up, move on beyond just the total transport, how we can join the dots between particularly transport and health and transport and worklessness. Another big statement, uh, the new economy wants a high-quality urban realm, it wants mass transit and it wants active travel. I think uh, a lot of the debate about transport, about what business wants, tends to focus where the CBI is coming from. We want big things. We want big airports. We want big roads. We want big railways. Well, yes, but also I think there's a whole new economy that actually uh, wants to locate in cities, not necessarily on business, boring business parks near motorways. Uh, HQs like Google want to be in cities. Uh, we have the uh, tech sector, we have the creative sector, everyone knows Hoxton, uh, we have the big pharma, a big trend towards people wanting uh, attractive urban environments and attractive urban realm. And one of the things we want to do is capture that a little bit more that has, than has been hitherto and give a bit of a di different dimension on the argument about what business wants and what's good for the economy in terms of transport. And also I think it raises a bit of a question around the balance of transport spend that we have between uh, measures that would improve the urban realm, which would contribute to the uh, environment that supports these important sectors of the economy uh, alongside uh, traditional uh, transport spend on uh, big infrastructure. We need the right skills for the data age. Uh, uh, big data is happening now. 90% uh, of the data in the world was uh, created in the last two years. Uh, do we have the right balance of skills? Do we have the, all the data where we need it? Is it compatible? How do, are we reading across from uh, data that national agencies have, that private sector has? And what are we doing at? What are we doing with it? Because there's clearly potential to give uh, transport users 
the information they need in the formats they want in, at the times they want it. And also, we can do transport planning, I believe, more cheaply, efficiently, and in a more open way if we use data right. And one of the things we want to do uh, in the coming year is to, to move forward on, on data, uh, starting with a, a big uh, seminar we're going to hold. Uh, taxes and PHVs are transport policy too. Uh, I think they tended to be shunted to one side, but with all the issues around air quality, around safety and security, around the previously mentioned Uber, I think we need to mainstream taxes and PHV policy a bit more than we have done, and that's another piece of work we'll be doing in the coming year. <clears throat> so, I said, um, uh, I gave you two reasons to be cheerful. Uh, the third reason I would say to be cheerful is that we do have in the Urban Transport Group a network of uh, a lot of the largest uh, urban transport authorities, uh, which uh, uh, across a good chunk of the country. We're always happy to talk to potential uh, new members to fill in some of those gaps there. And I think uh, what we try and do is to do three things, to make the case for urban transport, to make the case for the, the funding and the powers that our members need. Uh, like the buses bill, we need to make sure we get that right. Uh, it'll be the third attempt to get the right set of powers for local government on buses after the 2000 Act, the 2008 Act. Uh, third time, we need to get it right uh, and only three little words in the wrong place can mean it's not too workable, but we're working on that one. Second thing we do is uh, we're a professional network that saves it money for its members uh, by doing more for less. Uh, again, with declining revenue, uh, why uh, uh, commission pieces of work five or six times, probably from the same lucky consultants, <laughs> uh, when we could do it collectively uh, at less cost. Uh, and the thirdly, I think, is providing some thought leadership for the wider sector, and I've tried to uh, set out in, uh, in a brief time available a few of the projects around some of these new emerging areas that uh, we intend to have a look at in the year to come. So that's my third reason to be cheerful. Thank you very much.